Good morning and welcome to Minibar 14. My name is Greg Daigle. I'm the Executive Director of Digital Watershed and this session is on Lenner, a primer on carbon-free heat tech. But what is Lenner and what does it look like? It can look like anything from a red-hot combustion chamber to a white-hot ceramic pipe to this experiment by MIT and even a blue hot plasma. When introduced to the public commercially it might look like a very slick animation, even a puppet show. But really, what is Lenner? Well, Lenner is an acronym standing for Low Energy Nuclear Reactions. It's a sustainable heat tech. It's not a renewable. It's not fission. It's not hot fusion. It's something other nuclear. It produces monstrous amounts of heat. There are no radioactive waste products. It emits no gamma or fast neutron radiation. It produces no greenhouse gases. And it's been reproduced by hundreds of researchers. And the question is, is this the year that it makes it out of the lab? It has also been called the new fire. OK, here's our agenda for today's session. We're going to start with the QR code burst. This has all the resource links in the presentation. Just point your camera from your cell phone or your tablet at it and then upload it to your computer and then you can get all of the links without having to take notes today. Then we'll start with It's All About the Heat, then Adam Spitz Smoke, My Path to Leonard. Leonard, 30 years in the making, when it was first called Coal Fusion a who's who of people in Leonard today. What I see is the four main players, the possibility of Leonard at the State Fair, and a final QR code burst, followed by discussion. Okay, here's the QR code burst. Get your cameras ready, and here we go. Okay, let's get started. First of all, it's all about the heat. This is from the Scientific American blogs, saying that industry is the largest consumer of energy worldwide. And if we take a look at the pie chart, industry is 32% of all the energy used worldwide, but 74% of that, about three quarters of it, is heat. The remainder is electricity. When most people think about solar, they think about electricity, solar panels, photovoltaics, wind energy, and some of that may be sold back to the grid. But it's clear that heat energy is really the important thing for industry. Here's the Mara Solar Thermal Project in Oman. This is a large greenhouse glass-like complex. And beneath each one of those panels is a long half pipe of glass. It's mirrored. And in the center of it, is a steam pipe. And that steam pipe is heated up and creates steam for, well, any local use. Now there is an irony alert here because this particular facility is positioned in the oil fields of Oman. And it is used to generate steam and that is used to pull heavy oil out of the ground, out of the oil fields. So, a little ironic. So let's look at a Ragone plot of power versus energy. In this case, peak power. What is power? Well, power is like, well, it's like a cup. You can fill a cup up very quickly, and you can empty it very quickly. Fill it up, empty it. Energy is more like a bottle. It takes longer to fill it up, longer to empty it, but it has much more reserve than a cup does. So if you're driving, let's say, an electric vehicle, and you want to accelerate, that's power. That's the cup. But if you want a longer driving range, that's energy. That's the bottle. So let's take a look at some of the typical devices and chemicals used to store energy. We start with superconducting magnetic energy storage, then conventional flywheels, 
supercapacitors, advanced flywheels, and now batteries, lead acid, um, nickel zinc, uh, lithium uh, iron sulfide, uh, lithium ion like you have in your cell phone batteries, uh, in your cell phones, uh, zinc air, and now we get to some of the uh, gases and liquids like hydrogen used for internal combustion engines. Also, methanol, gasoline, and finally, hydrogen like might be used in fuel cells. So how does this compare to straight up nuclear? Plutonium is way up the scale, six orders of magnitude greater as far as energy goes. But as far as the power goes, it's about the same as a very good conventional flywheel. So how does Leonard compare? In this case, we're looking at the 2014 results of the ECAT. It has almost as much energy as a plutonium reactor, but it has a thousand times more power. That's power in, power out very quickly. A fission reactor does not have that. It may take quite a while to get it up to speed, which is why often fossil fuel powered power plants are left online to make up the difference in the shortfall of capacity for a fission reactor. So how much energy is consumed? Here's a sand key plot from Lawrence Livermore Laboratories. This is 2011. It shows all the different sources of energy on the left hand side. Energy generation in the orange block in the middle. Pink areas are where it's used. And on the right you have in dark gray energy services, that's energy used, and rejected energy, that's waste energy. I also have the results for 2018 and in that you see that coal has gone down, natural gas has gone up, solar has actually gone up quite a bit. I can toggle back and forth between them a bit so you can see. But to make it a little bit easier to see, I also have all of the results between 2011 and 2018. You can see here that solar has gone up 500%, about six times more over the last seven years. Actually, over the last decade, it's gone up like 48 times. We see that hydro is down, that wind energy is up 116%. Natural gas is up, all that fracking. Coal is down about a third. And petroleum is up just a little bit. At the same time, energy generation is down about 3%. So I guess that has to do with conservation. But on the right-hand side, in the pink areas, residential, commercial, industrial, and transportation, you see that all the energy usage there is up considerably, between 4 and 11 percent. But let's take a look at the actual energy that's used, the energy services. That's down 22 percent. That's mostly due to conservation, but at the same time, waste energy, rejected energy, that's up 23 percent. And what they say at Lawrence Livermore Labs is that that's primarily due to well, in, in fact, in the last uh, year, in 2018, there was a lot of heat around the world, so a lot of HVAC, and also it was a very cold winter, so a lot of extra heat to warm up houses and businesses. But also it just means that we're not collecting as much of the heat energy that goes up out the smokestacks when you generate electricity and out the tailpipes emissions. So Americans used more energy in 2018 than any other year. Energy services have gone down nine quads. Again, that's quadrillion BTUs, mostly due to conservation. And rejected energy, that is waste, has gone up 12.9 quads, mostly due to waste. Let's take a look at this a little bit closer on the right-hand side. Two-thirds of the energy generation was wasted due to electrical transmission distances, for example, wind farms in Iowa all the way up to the Twin Cities, and heat out the smokestack. The waste has doubled in residential and in commercial, and in industrial, the waste is about tripled. Energy that's used in the industrial sector has gone down by about a third, but it is still the largest user of natural gas. And transportation will remain the largest user and waster of petroleum until more electric vehicles are sold and used. And Leonard provides solutions to these areas. So how does the energy output of Leonard device compare to 
say, the energy output of a photovoltaic. Well, photovoltaics have come a long way in the last 60 years, and now the rating is up to about an 18.7% conversion, meaning a 65 by 39 inch panel can produce as much as 320 watts. But that's a rating that is not necessarily for every location on the Earth. A photovoltaic panel in Minneapolis may receive about 312 watts of solar energy per hour. Now you can use that 18% conversion rate to convert the solar energy to electrical energy. That produces about 56 watts of energy per hour. Assuming that the ECAT SK produces about 22,000 watts of energy per hour, how many photovoltaic cells would it take to produce the same amount of energy? That's about 393 solar panels. And with an area of about 17.5 square feet per panel, that would cover about 6,900 square feet. So unless you have about a 7,000 square foot house, you won't generate nearly as much energy as an ECAT. Of course, 22,000 kilowatt hours is a lot of energy and most homes don't need that much. But you could still take some of that excess energy produced by the ECAT or other Leonard devices and convert it to electricity. There is a Swiss company called Leonard Cars and their focus is on taking the heat from Leonard and converting it to electricity either through photovoltaics or microgenerators and using that to trickle charge the batteries in an electric vehicle. But that's not the only concern. Electric vehicles also demand a lot of heat. So let's look at DC energy consumption for a range of different electric vehicles. Here it is for the 2018 Nissan LEAF. You see the green area is for operating the vehicle at 75 degrees Fahrenheit. The light blue area 20 degrees Fahrenheit with the cabin temperature turned off. The dark blue area is operating at 20 degrees Fahrenheit with the cabin heat turned on. Here it is for the 2018 Volkswagen e-Golf. For the 2018 Chevrolet Bolt. For the 2018 BMW i3s. And the 2017 Tesla Model S. But it's difficult to understand what DC energy consumption means when applied to how far you can drive. So let's take a look at the driving ranges. The 2018 Nissan LEAF, with the cabin heat turned on, loses about 29% of its range. The Tesla Model S loses 37% of its range. The Volkswagen e-Golf loses 42% of its range. The BMW i3s loses 48% of the range. And the Chevrolet Bolt loses a full 50% of its driving range. So how did I come to explore Leonard? Well, I call it atoms, bits, and smoke. I've always tried to position myself in places where new things are happening, new designs are being put forward. For atoms, it was my work in industrial design, first designing for Herman Miller, the studio that developed the Aeron chair, and then doing designs for Cray Research, concepts of electric mowers for Toro, and the first fused deposition modeler, you guys know it as 3D printing. This one was done for Stratasys about 32 years ago. And then BITS. BITS is my work in digital media. Uh, we formed a company and we did the first interactive media version of a real world magazine. This was done for Macworld. We also did STEM software like What's the Secret? which included some of the first instances of digital badges and we had some fun interactions in there as well. Most recently I've been working as QA manager for the introduction of Zebra Zaps which was developed by one of the co-founders of Macromedia and during that time I was teaching at the University of Minnesota working on a variety of things on web design and interface design 
including affinity mapping and feature ranking. Smoke is the fun stuff. That's my work looking at products that are not really even out of the laboratory yet. They include digital ink for doing programmable tattoos, working with physicists in Germany who are trying to define a fifth fundamental force of nature, experimenting with nanoferrofluidic lenses so that you can actually see magnetic fields move in real time, and an infamous group called STORM. And I was working under an NDA to them, and they developed what they called Orbo, a never-die battery. They came up with a cell phone and a recharging station that never needed to be plugged in. Soon after that, they found that the components inside were not up to par. The CEO was fired, the company went belly up, and no one has really heard from them since, although the CEO is now one of the largest cryptocurrency miners in all of Ireland. Now let's hear about some of the beginnings of Lenner, known as Coal Fusion back in the day. This is from LennerCanner.org. Martin Fleischmann, one of Britain's leading electrochemists, and his colleague Stanley Pons, then chairman of the University of Utah's chemistry department, reported that they were able to create a nuclear reaction at room temperature in a test tube. Since then, cold fusion has been replicated in hundreds of experiments, in dozens of major laboratories, all reporting similar results under similar conditions. Most cold fusion reactors produce low heat, less than a watt, but a few have been much hotter. Here are 124 tests from various laboratories, grouped from high power to low. Only a few produced high power. Most produce less than 20 watts. In 1996, at Toyota's IMRA Research Lab in Europe, a series of reactors produced 30 to 100 watts, which was easy to detect. They continued to produce heat for weeks, far longer than any chemical device could. The core of the Toyota reactor was about the size of a birthday cake candle. A candle burning at 100 watts uses up all of the fuel in seven minutes, whereas one of the Toyota devices ran at 100 watts continuously for 30 days. That's thousands of times longer than the candle. It produced thousands of times more energy than the best chemical fuel. SRI International and the Italian Agency for New Technology were able to get all of the critical factors just right and achieve the cold fusion reaction in several tests. It is not difficult for an expert to reach a ratio of hydrogen atoms to palladium atoms of about 60%. This takes a few days, but it isn't high enough to trigger a cold fusion effect. You have to go higher, and the higher you go, the harder it gets. But with the right kind of metal and good techniques, the amount of hydrogen in the metal gradually rises. When it reaches 90 atoms and other conditions are met, bingo the cold fusion reaction turns on. This graph shows an exponential increase in power when the ratio of hydrogen atoms to palladium atoms exceeded 90%. A Toyota lab also saw the exponential increase above 90%. Hundreds of other researchers have seen the same effect. This is one of the graphs generated by Michael McCubre of CRI International. The lower part of the graph shows the coefficient of performance, the heat that's generated. And it isn't until you get to about 90% loading of gas into the metal that you begin to see a result. The upper graph shows the pressure of the hydrogen and deuterium gas. And once you get to about 80%, the pressure begins to go down because now it's being incorporated into the metal matrix. And once you get above that 90%, that's when the heat is generated. Here's another graph from Macubre. This looks at 51 different experiments that were reported on Lenner, and only the ones that were at 100% loading of the gas into the metal matrix show excess power in all the studies. The ones that were below that, even 95, 90%, those had a mixture of outcomes, with some of the outcomes, actually most of the outcomes, showing no observed excess. So this is really very difficult to achieve, but below 
you don't get anyone showing excess heat power. There have been some breakthroughs in Lenner after Flashman and Pons. In 1994, physicists Piantelli and Focardi reported 40 watts of thermal excess power using nickel rods, not palladium, with textured surfaces and using hydrogen, not deuterium. In 2009, Bacardi and engineer Andrea Rossi began making claims of kilowatt levels of energy, this time using nickel nanopowder. And in 2010, Defcalion Green Energy, who I don't believe is around anymore, also began to make claims of kilowatt levels of output. If you want a great source for collections and a library of different experiments run, go to leonardcanner.org. They list almost 1,800 peer-reviewed publications on condensed matter nuclear science, which is another way of describing Lenner. So who's who in Lenner? I'm going to show you just a few pages, go through them very quickly. Just wanted to show you some of the highlights of the organizations and the people involved. They include NASA, Brilliant Energy, Carl Page, a Danish energy consortium, a Swedish energy consortium, the ENEA of Italy, and they're important because Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation have been looking at them to fund some of their experiments. The U.S. Navy Spaywar, Space and Naval Warfare Command, they've been looking at Leonard for a good 20 years. Tadahiko Mizuno, he's one of the lead experimenters in Japan. In the United States, Professor Peter Hagelstein of MIT and Mitchell Schwartz of MIT, I mentioned before Leonard Kars out of Switzerland and Andrea Rossi, but also involved are Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. You may have seen some interviews done on 60 Minutes about a decade ago. Seashore Research, they are not around anymore, but all of the major experimenters have gone to different organizations. Toyota Motor Corporation, MIT, and Texas Tech. Lenner investors are really heavy hitters. The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Carl Page, who founded the Anthropocene Institute, and of course his brother Larry Page. More of the major companies engaged in Lenner include, as mentioned before, Mitsubishi, Toyota, Nissan, Boeing, National Instruments, Siemen, and Exxon. Theorists and experimenters in Lenner include some big names. Brian Josephson, Nobel Laureate, NASA's Chief Scientist, a NASA Senior Researcher, Los Alamos Labs, University of Siena, and the Chairman of the Swedish Skeptics Society. And you can bet that the Chairman of the Skeptics Society wants to make sure that this is not some sort of a scam. So let's look at what I consider the four major players. First of all, there's Brilliant Light Power. Dr. Randall Mills actually has a theory that is a little different from all the other Leonard theories, of which there are probably about 22 or 23 now. It involves the quantum mechanics of hydrogen. And even though it's a theory not supported by a lot of research, there are two validation reports on it, one from the University of California at Berkeley and the other one from Rowan University. What's really great about Brilliant is that they are fearless in showing their experiments in the laboratory. Some of the ones that work and some of the ones that don't work. This one is a red hot capacitor bank and this was recorded in February of this year. But back in September, they also showed some of their experiments. And notice the guy with the glasses in the background. Now he's wearing his face shield. There's also Brilluin Energy. 
and they have a very slick client-facing animation. We'll watch just a moment of it and then kind of skip ahead to some of the more interesting stuff. To power our civilizations, humans have turned to coal, oil, and natural gas. They're cheap and plentiful, but they pollute our atmosphere, soil, Brillouin Energy is developing high-tech boilers, which rely on low-energy nuclear reactions to produce safe, green, low-cost power. Think of it as an energy amplifier that turns one unit of energy into multiple units without any toxic waste or dangerous radioactivity. It uses patented electronics to manage the reaction, producing heat at a controllable and unprecedented rate. Its commercial applications can be safely implemented in homes and businesses around the globe. The prestigious Stanford Research Institute International has verified Brillouin's unique technology. Now you can help us bring it to the market. Check our website to learn how you can help end the global dependence on fossil fuels. Let's power the world together. BrillouinEnergy.com Brillouin has a boiler system as mentioned, but it's powered by a hot tube and this is a, an image of the hot tube. Again, this uses nickel and hydrogen. Here is a study by SRI International, as mentioned in the animation. And you'll notice on the right-hand side the COP, or the coefficient of performance. Here they call it power out over power in. And in the upper right-hand corner, you see it just about gets to 2.75. Now, right around that range, or a little bit over three, is about where real work can be done. As mentioned previously, Google is in the game. They have research being done out of Monday Labs at the University of Maryland. And they have filed two patents, which just recently have become public. Here is one of the patents. And you may notice that Lenner is not used in the abstract. You may have to go looking in the Google patent searches just to find something associated with Leonard. Here's the thing about patents. The U.S. Patent and Trademark Office and the International Patent Classification System, the IPC, use the same system, but the U.S. only started to actively accept patents with the term cold fusion in 2012. By mid-year of 2012, there were already 93 European cold fusion patents but there were only 12 in the U.S. Today, there are 1,381 patents for cold fusion, and that number is increasing all the time. Finally, we have the ECAT. ECAT stands for Energy Catalyzer. It uses powdered nickel, lithium, and lithium aluminum hydride. The products have been a one megawatt thermal plant built into a container and which ran for an entire year. After that, Rossi began building smaller ECAT units, including the HotCat, the ECAT QX, and the ECAT SK. The business model for the ECATs is really very interesting. They sell heat, not the actual device. So they bring it to the site, have it installed, and charge the client 20% less than whatever they're paying right now for heat. Commercial introduction happened at the very last day of January of this year. And yes, there were puppets. One of the advantages of the ECAT and several of the other corporations dealing with Leonard is that they use nickel. The cost of palladium, as was used by Fleischmann and Pons, is $45,000 per kilo, while nickel is about two and a half bucks per kilo. The COP for the ECAT SK was reported to be as high as 50 or more, and compare that to Brillouin's COP of just 2.75. This is one of the reasons why people are a little bit skeptical of such generous amounts of heat being produced by Rossi. If you could get the ECAT to self-sustain, that would mean a COP that was even higher. But there are dangers then of a possible runaway reaction. And I know that many in the field are working on that right now. 
But if you were to get it, but if you were to get a Leonard device to self-sustain, would it take less energy to keep it going? In the case of the SK, plasma consumes about eight ten thousandths of a watt and produces 22,000 watts of heat. So what kind of device could be used to supply the energy needed to run the ECAT SK for, say, a year and a half? That would be a standard C-cell battery. Rossi has his own theory about how the ECAT works. In this case, in a published study, he says that the lithium joins with the proton to become beryllium, and it's the beryllium that splits into two alpha particles. And notice that the alpha particles are really just versions of helium. Remember that people had called this cold fusion. Perhaps experimenters seeing the helium produced therefore thought it was fusion rather than some different nuclear path. Based upon the outcome of one of his experiments, Rossi says that what's really happening is that isotopes are being shifted in both lithium and nickel. Here we see a natural abundance of the isotopes as ions for lithium and for nickel and the fuel abundance so it mirrors pretty closely what the natural abundance is. After the run the ash was analyzed and it was found that almost all of the lithium had gone into lithium-6 from lithium-7 and almost all of the nickel from nickel-58 and 60 had gone into nickel-62. There are several validations of the ECAT experiments. These are all included in the QR codeburst. Finally, Digital Watershed did propose an exhibit at the Minnesota State Fair for 2019. This was to be housed in the Eco Experience, but we're not there yet. The State Fair is looking for announcements of actual products being used in the field, and we're hoping that will happen before the State Fair. That's it for today. Thank you for attending. And get ready, we're going to do the final QR code burst in just a moment. Get ready? Here we go.